Well, let's, let's get into God's Word. Let me pray. Father in heaven, <clears throat> you always care for your children. You love us so much, Lord. You will go to great extremes to draw us to yourself and great extremes to change us into what you want us to be. You guide us, you provide for us, and Lord, you give us peace, and we thank you for this. Lord, bless your word today. Open up our hearts and minds to receive what you have for us today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, yesterday was August 15th, the day that uh, Japan and countries all over the world actually celebrate the end of the war. But here in the Pacific Theater, it's, it's August 15th when uh, the end of the war is uh, remembered. The uh, Prime Minister of Japan at times will go to Yasukuni Shrine to remember the war dead. And the Emperor and his wife lay a wreath at the memorial area that they've seen. You might have seen it on the news. It's really quite an elaborate ceremony. Um, I watch I watch it almost every year. This year I only saw a little bit on the news because uh, I was not in the mood to watch it yesterday. But uh, a few years ago, my one of my sons said, you know, since it's the end of the war celebration, why aren't they having a party? Why aren't they celebrating? The war is over. You know, it's always so solemn and so sad. It should be a happy event. But the war is over, and uh, the peace treaties were signed, and so there, the peace was guaranteed. And that's the title of my message today. And uh, we'll talk about some things about war and, and what it means to us in many different aspects. But first, let's, let's look at uh, God's Word and what uh, we're going to use today for some for text. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. I really love the book of Colossians and I'm writing some, some outlines and some things maybe someday I would kind of like to publish. I, I love this book. I love all of Paul's writings. But uh, Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 23. Really, we're going to concentrate on verses 21 through 23, but uh, God, let's just read it from 15 through 23. He is the image of the invisible God. Talking about Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or powers, or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile, keep that, that word in your head and in your heart, through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. And verse 23, if you continue in your faith, establish and firm, not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you have heard, that you heard, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Amen. Now, good word. Lots of good. Uh, Bible studies, good sermons, good ideas, good thoughts in that word. Well, wow. sure is a lot. 
Japan surrendered on August 15th to the United States and its allies. And that was what I was just talking about a few minutes ago. Um, World War II was a definitely a world war. It was the most widespread, wide fought, widely fought war ever. The estimates of the casualties, just the people who died, military and civilian, run from 50 to 70 million. Amazing number of people that died over a six year period. The war started in seven, September, basically in September of 1939 and went through August 15th of 1945. A lot of people were uh, killed by on both uh, sides of the world and it was a, a war that was just long and tragic, terrible war and so, uh, as I mentioned, I think on August 15th we should be going, yeah, finally it ended. And uh, wars happen. They, they've always uh, been around and, you know, it's, it's just a tragedy that they keep happening over and over and many people die. And, you know, I really don't believe God likes war. And he... He is not for war. In a sense, um, the wars continue to happen. The Bible tells us there will always be wars and war, rumors of wars. Now, for a war to take place, there has to be two powers, right? Two, two groups, at least two uh, groups that are not getting along, disagreeing, and they are. Uh, disagreeing on many fronts. The war we're going to talk about today, I'm going to mix the physical wars and the war between man and God here. Now, look at this. This is what's going on between man and God. Man and God are at war, basically. We've got finite, limited human being, you know, just a little bitty us, who is hostile toward God. Turn with me to James chapter 4 verse 14. And we'll see what what man is like in comparison to God. James chapter 4 verse 14. Sure, I can get this. I'm still trying to work on uh, my slideshow here so I can see it like I want to see it. You can bear with me for just a second. not listening to me. James chapter 4 verse 14. Why do you, why you don't man, talking to man, talking about man here, why you don't even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And it goes on to talk about, you know, making arrogant plans for the next day. But what is man? How, how big and important we think we are that we can stand against God. What, what, are we, what does it say in James that we are? A mist. Watch this. This is what we are. Let's see if I can get it to work. That's a mist. There you go. Gone. Just for a second. A mist. Now who's going to clean that up? That's what he or she was, Pastor Hiroshi was thinking. Kevin, you can wipe it up. Yeah, miss, just like that. We're here for a second. We're limited. We don't know where we'll be tomorrow. We don't know if our car will be out of the shop in a week or two. We don't know 
you know, our flights, we're going to match flights, we're going to make it. You know, every time my son gets on an airplane, we feel sorry for the people that are riding with him because he delays every flight that he's ever been on. Ah, never fails. And, you know, we can't control so much. There's so much out of our control. But we think we're so important. And we are hostile toward God. God, the eternal God Almighty. We want to fight with this guy. We want to stand against him. We want to go to war with him. Well, let's look at what kind of a God we're talking about here. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 10. Verse 10. This whole chapter talks about God and idols. But in verse 10, Jeremiah says, The Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the eternal King. When He is angry, the earth trembles. The nations cannot endure His wrath. He is eternal. He is big. He's strong. He's powerful. We cannot resist Him. He's God. Eternal. Forever. He had no beginning and no end. And here we are, finite man, just a little mist. And we think we can stand against Him. We make our own rules. We uh, try to set up our own way of salvation. Well, we choose our own gods. And so... We are born in sin, but we continue to sin as men. We rebel against God. We, we want to do things our way. So naturally, God says, well, I want you to come and live with me, and I will live with you, and I'll be inside of you. But I'm going to set the standards. You do it my way. And we go, well, I believe Buddha's got you. Well, wait a minute. I, I'm making yours. I'm the eternal one. You're just a mist. And so we have this conflict going on. Man needs God. Man is not at peace with God. Man without Jesus Christ doesn't have peace. And God naturally is hostile towards sinful man and we have we go to war as a result. Well what are some causes of war? Sorry. We can see that distance is a cause of war. World War II, um, the, the countries of the West were had some idea of how the world should be run and far, far away Japan, there were some other events and there were Asian thoughts. So the distance, the physical distance between Japan and, and America and Japan and the rest of the world was there was that distance and communication not not working out and trying to get communiques to certain people at certain times and it not working out and distance caused uh, war in a sense because communication wasn't there. How about between you and a friend? Can conflict happen because there's distance between you? Can there be a lack of communication? Today we have Skype. We have iChat, and we can keep that communication going. But long distances can really draw people apart, draw countries apart, and distance naturally uh, causes some problems. There are some emotional problems uh, that could cause war. People's feelings get in the way. Nations think differently. There are cultural issues. Uh, Japan thought that you know they should control Asia and the West shouldn't have anything to do with it. And we thought that Japan should understand the West's way of thinking. So those cultural things came into play as well. So we've got those kind of things that caused problems and caused war. There were misunderstandings culturally, uh, emotionally, and how about spiritually? Are, are there some problems? There's distance. Uh, a problem for us spiritually? Well, let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 and see. The distance is a problem. We're going to look at quite a few scriptures today. <clears throat> Ephesians 
Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13 but now in Christ Jesus you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ so you were once far away there was a distance between you and God there was a big gap between man and God and that gap caused hostility miscommunication God would try to communicate his love to us to sinful man and man could either accept that love or reject it but sometimes we hear from God and he's revealing things in our life that we're not comfortable with and so we naturally increase the distance we don't want to be close to God so we get further away from God and we harden our hearts so distance is not only the cause of the war to begin with but it's increasing the more we reject the love of God so before we're believers we're at war we're in a hostile stage with God because of the distance so once we say yes to Christ then that gap is closed in this verse in when Paul wrote to the Ephesians he said once you were far away there was that distance between you but what Christ has done is close that gap how about behavior behavior is another cause of war in recent wars we know that the United Nations set up certain resolutions and countries stood against those resolutions and didn't follow the resolutions and so the United States and their allies went to war with certain countries because of that unacceptable behavior by international law causes war unacceptable behavior by uh, certain social standards certain norms um, other countries won't stand up won't stand for misbehavior for example in World War II Japan was invading other Asian countries and the West was saying wait you gotta cut that out you can't do that you can't just invade our allies and so people went to war because behavior was unacceptable Oops. I'm really having fits with my slideshow so please be patient with me and sometimes we go to war because the hate behavior of a nation is just plain evil there are certain things that people all around the world will not stand for also man and God are at war because our behavior is evil our behavior is unacceptable to God Colossians 121 part of what we read just a few minutes ago tells us once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior you behaved we behaved in a way that was unacceptable to God and it naturally put us in a position where we were enemies of God we weren't friends of God we are actually the enemy of God so when the Bible talks about peace with God it's not talking about peace of mind uh, God gives me peace in my heart yeah that's true to a point but God God and mankind are no longer at war that's the peace we're talking about we're just evil in our behavior because we stand against God well what does reconciled mean we read here in two places in Colossians that God wants us to be reconciled to him verse 20 and through him to reconcile to himself all things God was pleased to have all his fullness dealt with, dwell in Christ and through Christ to reconcile to himself all things J.I. Packer a Christian author said this about reconcile reconcile means to bring together again persons who had previously fallen out to replace alienation you know, that distance hostility anger toward one another and opposition by a new relationship of favor goodwill and peace and this is what happens when somebody comes to Christ right God and man are 
you know, they've had a falling out. We are alienated from God. There's distance between us and God. There's hostility between us and God. We reject God's love. God is angry at our sin. And when we finally give up, when we finally surrender, we are reconciled. We are brought back into a good relationship with God. We are at peace with God. That new relationship begins. There's favor. There's goodwill. There's peace. There's no longer any war because we're all those things have been removed. And the distance has been removed too. The gap has been closed. Now, how are these powers reconciled? We don't like war, but what happens during war? There's bloodshed. There's death. And there's victory. These things seem to be inevitable for two powers that have been at war to be reconciled. Right? In order for us to get back together, it's very unfortunate that these two, these three things have to happen. There has to be some bloodshed, there has to be death, and there has to be a victory. Now, very interesting thing here, unlike war between human beings, where the stronger power, the winner, the the more powerful guy sheds less blood and there's less death and destruction on his side. In this case, the guy, the power, the victor is the one who does the shedding of the blood. His own blood is shed. His own death happened on the cross. And that's what caused the victory. Let me read again first uh, from Colossians chapter 1. Starting in verse 19, I put verse 20 up here. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or in heaven, by making peace through his blood. His blood had to be shed, and he shed it on the cross. Verse 21 and 22, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, verse 22, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. And then through victory, let's go to uh, 1 John chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, and read from there. I'm doing this without any notes. I can't see my notes on my computer, so please forgive me for making it up as I go along. We'll get there. First John chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. This is love for God, to obey His commands, and His commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, what is the victory? Surrendering to Jesus Christ. How are you reconciled? Through the shed blood on the cross, through the death of Christ on the cross, through his resurrection, and through our faith in the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. How do we obtain victory? It's the pattern in any war, except in this case, the one who did the conquering is the one who shed his own blood and died on our behalf and gained the victory for us. So, we are reconciled as we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, why do we have to be reconciled? Isn't, isn't there another way? Can't we just live our normal life? I mean, who says we're at war with God? Can't we just do this our own way? I mean, why do we have to do it like this? I mean, can't we just be good? Can't I just be a nice person? 
So what happens when we get saved? How are we reconciled? Why do we have to be reconciled and how does it happen? Isaiah chapter 59 gives us an idea. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that you will not hear. So sin, we're born with sin, and then we continue in sin. It separates us from God. We automatically are in a state of war with God because we, we don't want his love. We have sin in our life and God can't endure sin. He can't bear sin. We can't be close to Him with sin. We can't be where He is with sin in our life. It separates us. We can't hear Him properly. We just can't be around Him. There's no sin where God is. And we want to be where God is. So the sin problem has to be solved. So how does it happen? It doesn't come from us. God initiates the reconciliation and presents us in a reconciled state. We have to go before God without any junk in our lives, as I said earlier when we were doing worship, without blemish, and we have to be righteous before God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19 gives us good idea of how God initiated his salvation for us. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ and not counting man's sins against them. Men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So, <clears throat> the sin problem has been taken care of by the victor. God won the war. God provided a way for us to be reconciled. We had sin in our lives that was separating us. God said, okay, here's a way for you to get rid of that sin so we can be reconciled, so we can be brought back together so we can become friends again, no longer enemies. Now, the peace has to be secured. I don't know if you can see that, but that's a signing of the peace agreement about a week after the actual surrender. The Japanese came aboard the USS Missouri, I think it is, and signed the peace treaty with the United States and the Allied powers. In the background is General MacArthur and I'm not sure who the, the admiral is in the front. Maybe Halsey, I'm not sure. But the Japanese are signing the peace agreement. They had to agree to it. It had to be something that both parties would agree to. Uh, the Japanese, the Empire of Japan said, uh, okay, you know, they've got these great weapons that's just going to annihilate Japan from the face of the earth if we don't surrender. They're much more bigger, more powerful than us. We give up. We surrender. Now, very interesting in war, and especially on the part of the West, and it, you know, it's historically it's happened several times, when a, one nation defeats another nation, the conqueror usually adds this to the peace agreement. I'm going to take care of you. The war's over, I won. You know, I'm bigger and more powerful than you. If you sign this peace treaty with me, you don't have anything to worry about. I'm going to take care of you. You might have to be, you know, subservient to me for a while, but your enemies will be my enemies. Your friends will be my friends from now on. I'm going to take care of you. That's in the peace treaty. Many countries have done that throughout the years. That's what we agreed, what Japan agreed to the United States and their allies with. They said, okay, we'll sign this unconditionally. And they came aboard the ship with no weapons, 
Uh, Japanese, you know the pictures probably. They wore top hats, tuxedos to the to sign the peace treaty. They didn't come in war gear. Some of them still had their, their military uniforms, but it was dress uniforms. They were presenting themselves ready to accept the peace treaty of the conqueror. And they knew that the conqueror would now take care of them. Not only would they guarantee peace, but the, the powerful United States and their allies were ready to take care of the nation of Japan, protect them, give them security. It took a few years, but it happened. Isn't that very interesting? When we say yes to God, when we realize that we are just a mist, that we can't defeat this God, we can't stand against him, there's no way we can win, and we surrender, we realize his love, and we say, yes, God saved me, God says to us, okay, this is the peace treaty. I will save you, and I'll take care of all your needs. I'll be with you all the time. You're going to be my ally. Until yesterday, you were at war with me. We we're fighting. We we're hostile toward one another. Not anymore. I'm going to take care of you. Even though he shed his blood, he died on the cross. And we should be the ones, you know, going, oh. But he goes, no, nope, I'm going to take care of you. That's what God does for us. That's what happens. I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is St. Patrick's Cathedral. It's the most popular Christian uh, site in Ireland. And you see the, can you see the words on there? Chancing one's arm or taking a chance uh, came, the say, this saying came from this cathedral. There were two warring factions, and I'm going to have to shut it down a little bit just to show you, be able to read uh, something, not shut it down, but in 1492, two families, the Ormonds and the Kildares, were in a feud, right? The feud grew and it turned into a, an all-out fight, as you know, I've written down there, and the Earl of Ormond and his family took refuge in the cathedral and they barricaded themselves inside. And you know, it went for weeks and weeks. And finally, the uh, Mr. Kildare, the leader of the Kildare family, said, the Earl of Kildare said, this is ridiculous. We're all Christians. We all go to the same church. We all worship the same God, same religion. We live in the same place. This is crazy. Let's get along. Let's stop fighting one another. He said we should love each other instead of fighting one another. And he called out to the Earl of Orman, Hey! I don't want to fight anymore. This is crazy. Come on out. And the Earl of Ormond said, uh-uh, you're up to no good. I don't trust you. I'm standing here. Come on! I'm not up to no good. Come on out, this is ridiculous. Nope, not coming out. So the Earl of Kildare took his spear and he chopped a rectangular hole in the door, the front door of the cathedral. And he stuck his arm inside. He said, take my arm. Take my hand. Shake my hand as a gesture of goodwill. Come on out. He's chancing one arm. I'd have locked it off if I'd been inside. <laughs> that wooden door stuck his head. This is called, actually this is called the door of reconciliation. You can see it's written right here. The door of reconciliation, pretty small, but it's written up there. And that's the, the door. They kept it like that for you. 
but the Earl of Ormond said, wow, okay. So he came out with all his supporters. They all hugged and the feud was over. And there's a picture of what God has done for us. We know the scripture in Revelations that says, Jesus Christ stands at the door of our heart and knocks. If we'll open it up, you know, there's a great painting of that door with no door knob on the outside. The door handle on the inside has to be opened up by us. God will stand at that door and knock until we open it up. Reconciliation. It was a tense moment, huh? Until he opened up that door. So the war is over. And the peace is guaranteed. So as a Christian, you need to we need to realize and reflect what God has done for us. I think August 15th is a good time to do that. <clears throat> Not only August 15th, but a few years ago, for three Sundays in a row, we had peace messages here. Pastor Hiroshi asked, I think Pastor Chris and me, to preach three Sundays in a row. Or was it Jim? Maybe it was Jim, huh? Yeah. So a European view of peace and an American view of peace and uh, Pastor Hiroshi here in Japan preaching on peace. And I think we had some variations in our ideas of what mankind viewed as peace but I think the thread that ran through was that peace is only guaranteed through Jesus Christ we are hostile toward God and we need to say yes and surrender to Jesus Christ in order to gain peace and to have the peace guaranteed by God himself let's pray Father in heaven, there's no way that we could set the peace treaty standards. You initiated reconciliation, Lord, because you loved us so much. Even though we wanted to be at war with you, we stood against you. We were hostile toward you, yet you continued to reach out toward us in love. Lord, in one way you chopped a hole in the door of our heart, reached in, asked us to take your hand of love. When we said yes, you reconciled us to yourself, Lord. You present us holy and blameless in your sight. Lord, we are at peace with you now as we have accepted your gift of love. Lord, thank you, thank you so much for reconciling us to yourselves. Lord, if we had time to go in to the word further, we would see that you have given us that same responsibility of reconciliation, Lord, to take the message of peace to those around us. Father, let us be faithful to share what's in our heart, the love you've given us, that others might be reconciled to you as well. We thank you for your word. Go with each one here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for putting up with my stuttering slideshow. Not behaving. God bless you.